Win by five touchdowns, slip from number one to number two. Is that fair? Is it right? Does it matter? Welcome to Buckeyes Live right here at the Voice of College Football. Breaking down the final two, of course, uh, Ohio State taking on Minnesota this week in the shoe, and then it's off to Michigan. We've got Kevin Noon right next to me, Buckeye Huddle, Tony Gerdeman below me, Buckeye Huddle as well. You can catch their podcast as well, Kevin and with the Big Me podcast. And uh, Tony, of course, delivering every day during the football season. Buckeye Weekly, Steve Hellwagon, Bucknuts 247 Sports. Guys, how are we doing today? Good. I'm doing well. All right, Steve. It was number one last week. And if it was voted on, ranked in a silo, uh, you know, that's certainly enough based on what happened to Michigan against Michigan State to keep them number one. But uh, there are other teams involved. And I got to say, I dropped them from one to two myself. So your thoughts about uh, the ranking? Well, I've had Ohio State number three all along in my top 10 or top 25 that are top 16, whatever it is that I do for the football writers. And my basic feeling was we've watched Michigan dominate opponents all season long. And that's why I had them uh, number two. And then Georgia uh, you know, 26, 27, however many games in a row it is. It's kind of the old adage, you got to be the man to beat the man. And, uh, you know, they've had some up and down games, certainly. But the last two weeks to do what they've done uh, to beat Missouri and to beat Ole Miss in the fashion that they did, I think that's been uh, impressive enough, I think, for uh, committee members to look at it and rationally say, I think that the resumes now compare very favorably uh, with Georgia and Ohio State, and uh, Georgia moves up to number one. The rankings are really not, you know, the end-all, be-all, all that important, other than it's going to determine, you know, one plays four, which might be a lesser opponent than two having to play three. Three might be a better team than four, but it should be, although I don't think there's a lot that separates these four teams that will uh, eventually play for the national championship in the playoff. But uh, to me, uh, you know, just getting into the playoff is all that matters. Somebody on my chat this week was like, well, should they have left the players in in the second half to impress the committee? I'm like, well, if you got two or three of those players banged up and they couldn't play against Michigan and you lose to Michigan because of it, then you miss the playoff because you lost to Michigan. So, uh, no, in answer, it doesn't matter. You know, they could beat Minnesota 17 to three this week. And as long as they beat Michigan three to two the next week, they're going to the playoffs. So that's all that really matters is winning the games and uh, not really how you, you look at it because there can't be any more than four undefeated teams. So they're not going to pull you out in favor of another undefeated team if you win but don't look very good here down the stretch. So uh, you're in if you win is basically it. And I don't necessarily see a scenario uh, where they can lose to Michigan and still get in at 11-1 and one like they did last year. That seems kind of far-fetched. So, And I have no doubt whoever gets to Indianapolis – would beat Iowa and, and, you know, go on. But uh, at any rate, that's my thought. No big deal. Georgia probably deserves it. And uh, win your games and none of it matters. I was led to believe that we started fresh every week. So this belief of however many games Georgia's won in a row shouldn't really matter, should it? Because it's a clean sheet every week, as we're told. Mm -hmm. Or not. Um, I expected Ohio State to come in at two this week. Um, I was not surprised, but that was largely based on just year to year how this stuff works. And I know Tony's got an interesting factoid he will share, so I will not tread on that land. But I will say that um, as for Michigan, its schedule did get a little bit better having played Penn State, a shared win that Ohio State has as well. So, honestly, Michigan winning bum fights out there the rest of its season does nothing for me whatsoever in terms of 
putting any validity into where it should be ranked uh, after two weeks of being told that resume, resume, resume matters. Um, so we can cross them off the board. Uh, as for Georgia, yeah, Georgia hit, Georgia beat Ole Miss badly. I mean, they they took their soul and then did awful things with the soul. I mean, it was it was an ugly, ugly game. Uh, kudos to them. I think that Ole Miss is somewhat of a legitimate team. I'm still not sold on Missouri. I don't care what Missouri did to Tennessee. I think Tennessee is a fraud. Any any team that's having to put its hopes and dreams on the big arm of Joe Milton gets what it deserves. But um, I agree with Steve in the fact that it's it's highly unlikely that the loser of the Ohio State Michigan game gets into the playoff. And I will say Michigan has a zero percent chance based on its it's it's resume if it loses to Ohio State to get in in that role. And Ohio State has a decimal chance. I mean, you know, less than 1%. It's going to take a lot of chaos to get them there. So let's not try and figure out the side door, the back door to get into the playoff if you're rooting for Ohio State. Just, you know, just win your games. But, you know, we're, we're starting to see some of the engineering of the rankings to – prop up the teams that they want to prop up and it will only get worse as we go on where we start seeing teams coming in in 23 who are there to solidify another quote unquote good win for somebody. But, you know, beside that, I will, I will uh, yield the rest of my time to the Senator from Northwest Ohio. That's you, Tony. No. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, um, so dropping from one to two is what I kind of expected. I think we all expected that. And I remember Ohio State being dropped in 2019 at the at the end after beating Wisconsin in the Big Ten Championship game. So I went back and looked to see how many times has a team dropped in the CFP rankings from number one to number two after a win. And it's happened four times now since 2014. Three of those times have happened to Ohio State. Two of those times, I didn't. Even, I forgot about the first time in 2019 when Ohio State dropped from one to two after beating Maryland 73 to 14, and that that was uh, the same week that LSU beat number three Alabama 46 41. So LSU jumped Ohio State, and then um, a week or two after that, Ohio State jumped back up to number one after a 28 17 win over number eight Penn State. LSU beat like a three and six Ole Miss by three touchdowns. So Ohio State retook the uh, the number one spot there, and then of course lost it in a championship weekend. So three of the four times that the number one team has lost for a win, they uh, Ohio State has been that person that that team that has dropped. And so I tweeted that out. And what I should have done is just mentioned at the top that this is just information because that's just it's just presented as information, but. I've got a lot of emotional Michigan fans in my mentions telling me to cry. And again, this isn't, these aren't, these aren't feelings. This isn't anything other than information. And then I see a, a bunch of other people getting emotional about it. I don't have, honestly, the dropping Michigan or dropping Ohio state after winning the big 10, I had a little bit of a problem with because of all of this, the situation going on there. But like this, this one, was expected, but I just thought it was interesting. I think it is interesting that three of the four times it's happened, it's been to Ohio State. Well, I got to say, Kevin and all of us here, I, in theory, do the same thing. I reconstruct the top 25 or reconstruct whoever I'm considering, 44 teams, 62 teams, whatever it is, but let's be practical about it. Uh, that's what I would like to do in theory, but uh, for a couple thousand views, I'm not sitting here for 17 hours reconstructing the entire season. So hopefully they've got the resources to truly follow through on that, because I think believe that's the best way to do it is to kind of clear the mind, clear the deck, reconstruct the season, because you've got not, uh, you know, beyond theory, you've got all these data points that change by the week. They're not the same data points that they were last week or five weeks ago. So they need to be reevaluated every week. So if they are doing Due diligence, yes, reconstructing the season. 
And that's what uh, Boo Corgan said last night. The first thing he talked about when moving Georgia ahead of Ohio State was the win over Missouri, which was weeks ago. You know, that's what um, that was one of the key things for them. And because Missouri's Missouri continues to play well and do better. And so that's that was one of the key factors for them in that decision. And then other than that, we have no idea how these other teams were evaluated. And and I'm not complaining in any such way that the rest of it held uh, down to the Ole Miss spot and wherever they dropped four or five places and Missouri jumping in there at, I believe, nine. Uh, The rest of it stood pat. Now, the committee can always lean later on, you know, three and four were razor close. We forgot to tell you that. Or, you know, there was this enormous gap between five and six or whatever it is. We, they've done that in the past. And so they reserve the right to explain the, the, the levels of the rankings and the, the proximity between each ranking uh, spot later when they need to. But as it stands, there's been no on the surface change in their evaluation of these teams across the board. Well, the, the, there's no point, in my opinion, of having weekly rankings in November or whatever, they should just, they're going to do whatever the heck it is they want to do. We've seen that it's helped Ohio state. It's hurt Ohio state. You know, it's, it's all there, but at the end of the day, they're going to do whatever it is they want to do. And and they can, because they're, they're a, they're the decision makers and B they're starting with a clean sheet. So they can just sit there and say, well, according to this clean sheet that we started, we see it this way. And it has nothing to do with the previous four or five weeks of polls that we 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 have fed to you and made you watch basketball games to get to and everything else. Um, I just, it's, it, it just seems real contrived and maybe, you know, maybe I'm just kind of beat down by this year or something like that, but I'm not having as much fun with these shows as I, the playoff shows that they're putting up on ESPN as I did before. I mean, maybe I've just been to the fair so many times and seen the broken down bear so many times that I'm just not, I'm not into it, but I'm, I'm extra, extra jaded this year. I can fall in line with that as well. I used to watch the thing and now I just do my own watch party. And so I don't hear anything that's said Mm -hmm. because I can't have that copyright go out. So I just, I just see the, the numbers and the teams and the logos pop up on the screen and I always think, I'll go back and watch that. No, don't go back and watch it. Have no, no, uh, no desire to go back and watch it. Well, and you Always can't hold them. Talk. You can't hold them accountable for something they say one week when they change their mind the next week. And like, there, there's no, um, no way you can punish anybody for a, a lie one week or whatever. And it's just, you know, it is what it is. Generally, they get it right in, in some form or fashion with the four teams, and I think they'll be able to get it right with twelve teams because. If we're complaining about 11 and 12 next year, which we will, but just be happy that you got the first 10 right, I guess, is what I would say. Well, when we get to 12 teams, my thought on that is, will there be a legitimate argument that A, B, and C, team A, B, and C, had an argument that they should have been number 12 or number 11 if 12 is the group of five team? Yeah, yeah, there will be legitimate arguments, and and I have no issue with that, and I'll I'll join in those arguments, but do mm-hmm. they have can do they have the right to whine and complain about missing the playoffs? No, they had ample opportunity to be a better football team with better results. Well, we'll also have a lot of seeding arguments. I mean, obviously, whatever whatever it comes to be with the demise of the Pac-12, you know, property of Oregon State and Washington State as of this moment pending appeal, um, whatever becomes of that spot. I mean, you're going to have, you know, your 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 conference highest rated conference champions and however that sorts in. But as you're going to be having first round games and so on, there will still be wild conspiracies. Some of them founded, a lot of them unfounded about how how that's being engineered and everything else. But I would rather get into that in terms of, okay, well, all these teams are included. Now we're just now we're going into the minutia rather than five conferences, four slots, everything else that's going on there. And certainly with many years of having two representatives out of one conference, including the Big Ten, uh, you know, this year shapes up to be a pretty wild year. 
where you could really have some interesting decisions with uh, a couple of one loss champions and even even potentially an undefeated champion in Florida State who I'm not sure where its resume really would stack up to some of these other teams and we know we know losses aren't necessarily losses when we're talking about the CFP committee. While we squabble over one and two, Jordan Kapler wrestles with this. Would you rather fight a hundred gopher sized Kevins or one Kevin sized gopher? That's way beyond me. I'd fight the Kevin sized gopher because a hundred gopher sized Kevins all would have, they would have a hundred hearts of champions and you would get, you would get pummeled that way, but just a dumb gopher. I mean, you know, just happens to be big and you know, a little overweight. And, uh, you know, I, I could, I could take that dumb animal, but a hundred gopher size me's forget about it. They would, they would work well together and, uh, they would take you down to pound town. <laughs> then, then I definitely don't want that. Can we uh, choose to not even consider either? Could, could we possibly choose that? That's not that how route? Jordan Kapler's super chats work. I choose not to fight. You're going to have to take your own life then. <laughs> All right. Well, Steve, uh, Michigan State didn't put up much of a fight on Saturday. Did that tell us anything about Ohio State? Because I think the Buckeyes played a near-perfect game or at least a near-perfect first half or so until they chose not to, um, you know, completely humiliate their opponent. I would expect it. Uh, I don't think I'm muted. Am I? You're good. Okay. I, I don't think that, um, I think that that went about the way that you would expect it to go. I think that, uh, you know, obviously Michigan state was kind of just playing out the string and that was kind of borne out with how they had played, you know, against Michigan, although they had beaten Nebraska the week before, but that's proving to not be that big of a feat, to be quite honest. So uh, to me, uh, I look at it that they wanted to go in and have a fast start, which they did. They wanted to be in control of the game at the half, which they were, and they wanted to get the key players out of harm's way uh, by middle of the third quarter, which they did. Like Trayvon Henderson was done at halftime. Um, I didn't see this, but I guess a Mecca Buca may have gotten injured, uh, maybe being out there a little bit longer than he probably could have or should have, but they're trying to get him back into the flow. It's like you you walk this thin line of, of getting guys ready and, and getting guys into the flow and everything else and also having them, you know, re-injure themselves and different things or – or hurt themselves. And so I thought the balance was almost uh, perfect last week. And I'm looking for a carbon copy again this week against Minnesota. You got another team that's just kind of there. They're five and five trying to get to a bowl game. Uh, This is the outside chance of all outside chances. If they win twice, which I think is Ohio state, Wisconsin, and Iowa loses twice to Illinois and Nebraska, they would tie and Minnesota would go to the Big Ten Championship. If it's just a two-way tie, uh, they would go to the uh, the Big Ten Championship game uh, because they have the, the tiebreaker. But that seems like such an outside, outside chance that that would possibly happen. So um, to me, it, this is about Ohio State, just as like last week against Michigan State was all about Ohio State. Yes, Michigan State did run the ball effectively the first two series, but Ohio State made a couple adjustments, got that taken care of. Michigan State never took a snap inside the Ohio State 34-yard line. That's pretty impressive. Uh, Let's see, at halftime, Kyle McCord was 21 of 25 for well over 200 yards. And I know that three of the incompletions, one of them was after a bad snap where the play was kind of screwed up. One of them, he was under pressure and threw it away. And one of them was Marvin Harrison, just nobody around, just straight dropped the pass, which is, you know, an anomaly in and of itself. I don't remember the fourth one, but that'll tell you just what kind of a half Kyle McCord, who's been Ohio State fans' favorite whipping boy all season, uh, you know, he played uh, his best half of football, in my opinion. So, again, it's Michigan State, which is playing freshmen out there in some key positions, and it doesn't look good right now for Michigan State. 
but uh, you know, Ohio State put its best foot forward. I thought. Yeah, don't look now. Kyle McCord, the number twelve rated passer in the nation, number twelve in yards per attempt, and that that dude had he had some protection in the first half against Michigan State and took advantage of it. He said, or Ryan Day said, they had spent a lot of time during the week before since the last game working on his footwork, just keeping it solid, pointed in the right direction, and you saw the results of that. You saw the accuracy that he was throwing with the the touchdown pass downfield to Marvin Harrison, dropped it in like C.J. Stroud has done 50 times in his career, and that's – that's the comic cord that people have been hoping to see and they saw it. And if they can, if he can continue that, then this team can beat anybody. And especially if they're going to protect him. Now, Michigan state is a bad team with a bad pass defense and bad rush defense and all of that. But it's still good to see this from Ohio state start to reach its potential. And I asked Ryan day and I asked Jim Knowles yesterday as well. Is this team is, is the offense playing its best ball you want to be playing your best ball in november are they doing that and he said they were and you're still adding pieces you're still getting healthier emeka abuka they said they held him out the from the set for the second half uh as steve said he did get a little banged up walked off um didn't seem to get be getting any much extra work or checking on the ankle or whatever but the more he is back, the more they can use him and devise things for him. But I also really, really like what they're doing with Xavier Johnson in the the 21 personnel and the two back sets, using him to run, uh, using him to uh, lead block for a play action wheel route, which is probably one of my favorite plays of the year. That was the pass that they threw down the sideline to Xavier Johnson. There, there's, there are some things that they can do with that, and they'll continue to do things with that just to supplement Travion Henderson and figure out a way to get by the loss of Mayan Williams and also not have to play Dallin Hayden. Although you're getting to the point where Dallin Hayden can start to play a couple of games. I wouldn't be surprised if he's playing against Michigan if they need him to. Uh, so I like what they're doing with the offense. Kate Stover getting back. Uh, they've got a ton of weapons right now. And uh, if, if a defense goes wants to go ahead and bracket Marv, you can, but as we saw, Michigan State tried it in the third quarter, and he ran right by right by both guys. So good luck with that. And then it's up to Kyle McCord to just be patient and take the other options, which he seems comfortable doing. Of all the games of football that I watched, that Michigan State game was one of them. That's about all I can say. I went into that game with zero care. I'm going into Minnesota with zero care. Uh, interesting factoid. I know I'm kind of advancing the story here. According to pick six previews, top five defenses in power five, opponent adjusted per play, Minnesota out of 69 division one, uh, one FBS power five teams, Minnesota is 63rd, even better than Michigan State at 50. And I know that you can't necessarily look at those rankings and say because of that, Ohio State's on par to score 20 percent more points over 38. But, you know, we're we're in the silly season before Michigan get through, take care of your business, rest your starters and be spending that time getting ready for the game that really matters at this point. Ohio State went out, was able to score 35 in the first half, looked like it was in position maybe to get a, an early touchdown in the third quarter. Kyle threw over the middle to Emeka, who was double covered on a uh, on post, and it didn't work out. But, uh, you know, I don't really have a ton of concerns about where Ohio State is outside of special teams largely. Um, I did find something interesting that I didn't even notice during the game on the offensive line where they had pulled Carson Hinsman out just to bring Matt Jones over to center, put Enoch Bamahi at guard, just, you know, just to try out a different group. Ryan Day was asked about it on Tuesday, said, oh, you know, we're just doing some things, but didn't give any indication that's something we're going to see moving forward. But it does certainly give Matt Jones some real game experience at center if they find that they're having a hard time with their normal configuration against Michigan here upcoming. My uh, favorite current Big Ten West fact, uh, maybe favorite because I think it's so ridiculous, but also because I discovered it because this is the way my mind works. I'm sitting there thinking about these three teams that were tied with Iowa for first place in the Big Ten two weeks ago. At three and two, there was a four-way tie. Since then, Nebraska, Minnesota, Wisconsin, the last two weekends have gone 0-6 in 
against a, a, a smattering of awful teams in the Big Ten, Illinois, Purdue, da, 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 and down the line, Northwestern. Then I looked at all those teams. They are a collective 7-29 and 29 against the rest of the Big Ten, aside from this six-game winning streak against the likes of Minnesota, Wisconsin. So in November, you've got teams tied for first place that lose six consecutive games to those types of teams. That's This has reached an all-time low. They, they yeah, are. On, on one hand, you got to be glad that uh, Penn State did to win because that they weren't going to backdoor their way in on the tiebreaker with uh, the way their West opponents have completely laid down here down the stretch. This has been uh, – I mean, you thought Wisconsin was going to be pretty good. I mean, you thought Minnesota was going to be pretty good. You really – Purdue played for the division championship – or the Big Ten championship last year, and they've been, you know, a disaster, although they just beat – you know, Minnesota. So yeah, it, um, I don't know. It, it didn't look good. It hasn't looked good. There's a lot of bad big 10 football this year. Um, too much of it. We, you know, we see Iowa in the top 25 of the CFP rankings. Not my top 25. Not bro. my top 25. <laughs> I hear you, but, um, you know, the problem is, is that they're sitting, whatever it is, eight and two at this point, And, they have two highly winnable games. It could be ten and two by the end of the season, but it goes to show the 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 weakness of the Big Ten and the favorability of having a good schedule in terms of not having to play the few lone good teams within the conference. But I am going to put a petition out. No matter who wins the Big Ten East, that the Big Ten West winner is not allowed within 500 yards of Lucas Oil Stadium. Um, I just think that a judge will grant that that temporary restraining order. The injunction will come through. And then I'm going to counter sue the big, or I'm going to sue the Big Ten West for emotional distress because I'm distressed that I have to watch any of the teams from the conference on that side because it is just, it's not, it's not enjoyable. It's just not enjoyable. I mean, you only get 12 regular season games a year and having to play three across the aisle with the, with those teams is just not good for anybody's psyche. Kevin just wants due process. I want just, due process. Just wants to be heard. He'll have his day in court. Uh, Sage Ohio with Greg Fry and JT Barrett had their had the best games against Minnesota. That 1989 Minnesota game will be something like I never forget because if you're not aware, Ohio State trailed in that one 31 nothing. It was 31 8 at the half. I believe when it was 31 nothing or 31 8 at the half, if it was on, we turned it off. Didn't, I mean, because the game was over. And then you find out they won. And then that back then is when you could watch the entire game the next day, Sunday morning. We could watch it Sunday morning on Channel 27 PBS out of Bowling Green. And that's when, that's how we would watch the Ohio State games, most of them, because only a few of them were on TV back in those days. But then you're like, well, we got to get up and make sure we catch the Ohio State, watch the entire win. Greg Fry throwing for like 362 yards. That was, I think that was the first time I ever saw an Ohio State quarterback throw for 300 yards. I didn't know it was possible until that happened. And this was 89. And he did that on 20 completions. He was um, 20 of 31 for 362 with just a long of 34 yards. But they were lighting it up. In the, in the second half of that one. You missed Art Schleitzer, Tony. You're too young. Yes. Threw 458 against uh, mm -hmm. Florida State, I think, was the number. But he had I a lost. few other ones yeah, in a loss. And uh, he and Dave Wilson went back and forth in a 49-42 game uh, where he threw whatever, 350 or so. Uh, my recollection of that game, Tony, I kept the faith. Uh, mm -hmm. So I watched it on through. I went to a party that night and I remember getting hit with about three or four of my friends right in my face. Aha, Ohio State sucks. Da, 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 da. I went, what? <laughs> they won. It wasn't uh, quite the Did we know, win? free flow of information back then. So still was, like seven hours later, people had no yeah, idea. I think I was in my, would that be my third or fourth, fourth year, I guess, at Ohio State. And um I have to say that uh, that was, uh, you know, you took your uh, your victories at that point uh, where you could get them, and I mean, it's I mean, imagine if you had an eight and four team now, 
I mean, they'd want everybody in the athletic department fired. I mean, not just the head coach, the athletic director. They'd want, you know, they'd want to burn the buildings down and fire everybody. And, um, you know, back then it was like, my God, you know, we pulled one out, you know, that type of thing. And um, so, uh, yeah, th things have changed uh, dramatically since then. People in my chat were like, uh, just as an example, are like, uh, has uh, time passed Mickey Marotti by, you know, whatever. I'm like, well, they're 38 and two under this coach in the big 10. I, I, I tend to doubt there's been another stretch in the history of Ohio state football where they've won 38 out of 40 uh, big 10 games. I, I just don't know when that would have been, but uh, you know, they've done that under this coach. So um, of course, I think one of those was that, that Rutgers game the year before when uh, Urban was on his suspension or whatever. But uh, so in, in consecutive manner, what is that? 37 and two. So uh, this guy's done pretty well. And Mickey marotti has been there preparing the team for all of it. And yet the only one that matters is next Saturday at Michigan. That's the referendum game and heads will roll if that, uh, if that doesn't go the way it's supposed to. So um yeah, it's kind of a kind of the world we're living in today compared to where it was in 1989. It was a si simpler time, but you know, may have been better time. I don't know, better or worse. I certainly took more joy out of the wins back then. I savored them, loved them. You know, uh, the world was riding on every W and L, depend regardless of what their record was. At least that was my world at my age at that point. But. uh that that uh, 1989 team actually they still for for all their mediocrity uh, had a one score game in the fourth quarter at Michigan playing for a tie of the Big Ten championship. Nuts, and that's with Bo Pelini and Jimmy Peel as your starting safeties. <laughs> that's yeah, right. That, they let it get bad. That's for sure. They let it get bad, and it was a few more years before it was any any freaking good. So it was, dude. It was it. From 87 to 91, I mean, you know, before anybody who, you know, my wife goes to the games and there'll be something will happen and the guy in her section will blurt out an F-bomb and, you know, blah, 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 you know, all this stuff, you know. Fire him, replace him, etc. He sucks. This, that, or the other. You know these fans. You know who, who act like that today should be forced to sit down and watch in in order every game from 1987 to 1991, and tell me about real pain and suffering. I think that would be uh, uh, really. Uh, you know there was a lot of it in that uh, five year stretch. 92, it got a little bit better. They tied Michigan. Um, it was that wasn't any better. I was in the stands. I was in seven C for that game, and we were all confused. No, I take it back. We were in seven A, and we were mm -hmm. all confused because we're like, should we rush the field? Is this like <laughs> something great here, or what? He said it was our greatest win. So. I mean, so we just went back to the fraternity house and drank. That's like what you did do. After, and and watch the real. And, and as I said, I. <laughs> As I've said any number of times, watch the real teams, Miami, Florida State, Notre Dame, USC, play on television in the late shift or whatever. So, yeah. Watch a team that didn't throw a pass against Illinois the entire first half under John Cooper. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, if throwing a, not throwing a pass is damnation, then damn Michigan. They didn't throw a pass in the second half against Penn State. Didn't well, they to. did. They threw one, but there was a – Really, really sketchy DPI on that. Really yes. sketchy DPI. I'm in the minority, but I argued that one myself. I don't. Yeah. My buddy said he thought the calls went Michigan's way for some reason. I'm watching the game. I didn't necessarily feel it was biased one way or the other, but it went Michigan's way. There were a couple of block at the backs on special teams plays that were missed. Yeah. I to, to the ref's credit or lack thereof, I mean, there were a couple calls that went against Michigan, too. I watched the game relatively clear-eyed because, I mean, I could sit there and make an argument either way for what, what the better outcome for Ohio State would have been. But uh, I did tweet at that point, 
I want to apologize now to all Penn State fans who I had considered loony for saying there was a Big Ten conspiracy against them. I have witnessed it because the <coughs> calls were atrocious. There were five horrendous calls against Penn State in that game that cost Penn State the win, and three of them were from James Franklin and two are from Manny Diaz. <laughs> <laughs> well, that too. That too. Franklin, Franklin chasing the two-pointer in the first half. Oh. I mean – 14 to 10 is not a terrible deficit. Uh, then he punted on – or he he went for it on fourth and two at their own 30 and didn't get it, and Corum took it 30 yards the other way, understandably, on the very first play because their defense had to be like, what up, bro? And uh, then when they finally do score and it's – you know, cuts it to nine – uh, instead of kicking the extra point and making it eight and keeping hope alive, he goes for two and the game is over. The and on a go. really weird two point play, a yeah. I mean, where no chance of scoring on that. Play. I mean, Drew Allar was not throwing very well, and it was in a situation where Drew Allar was going to have to throw it. There was there was no subterfuge, there was none of that. There was a guy that I saw kind of who looked like the primary target who Michigan obviously saw immediately, and then he was forced to scramble. But thankfully, they got rid of of the fall guy, Mike Yersich. He's gone. And, you know, now everything is going to be hunky-dory now in State College. Yeah. And it wasn't fourth and two. It was fourth and six. And that, that yeah. makes okay. it even fourth worse six. with um, with time to go and, and, what, four minutes at that point, I think, and a, a timeout or two, like, Boy, that was – Franklin after the game said, well, we knew points were going to be in a premium. That's why they went for the two. You know, you go for the two in the first half and you can cut it to three because you don't think you're going to make a score. But, yeah, it, they lose by nine. He cost them nine points with the two-point – the two two-point decisions and not punting the ball from his own 30. And then, of course, Michigan picks up two third and longs when on running plays because Manny Diaz is attacking and blitzing and those two those two plays end up in touchdown drives. So if you stop those two third downs, if this, if that, if this, if you stop those two third downs, you give up three points on those two downs instead of 14. And there there, there are a number of ways that Penn State could have won this, but not with James Franklin on and, and his coordinators, frankly, on the sidelines. James Franklin needs to be driven to a tarmac and fired. <laughs> oh, dear. And the thing is, he's got like seven years left on a contract, too, so he's not going anywhere. Oh, so. Texas A&M says, hold my beer. Yeah. I think Penn State's in a, an okay position right now. Just get to the playoffs and play somebody other than Michigan and Ohio State and see what happens. Yeah, they need to get him to next year where he can then make the playoffs, you know, four, four years out of every – or three years out of every four. Right. And uh, keep everybody at bay. That's. I don't want to take over Mark's show, but let me ask Mark, what were your thoughts on Sharon Moore's post-game little comments on the field? I'm sure you saw those. Well, Weren't those something – yeah. So, 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 so my comment on that is basically uh, there's nothing morally, ethically wrong about it. Do what you want. Spew on whatever. I don't want my head coach acting like a fool. That's maybe he was crying because he knows a giant show cause is coming his way. <laughs> Could be. It was. Could I mean, be. people I mean, and then people are trying to compare it to the Ryan Day post Notre Dame situation or whatever. I think I think both of them came from ser from real points of of motivation. There was there was there was a motivated speech to to come out, but I really felt that you know the Sharon Moore I I used as the example the meme of the guy riding the bicycle carrying the stick, then sticking the stick in the front in the spokes of the front, <laughs> window, and then being on the ground grabbing his knee in pain. It it, it just all fits into this victim mentality. It all fits you did it into to yourself. Yes. That was the term I used, and I actually posted a video that said Michigan's a victim. Yes, this victim mentality, and then Harbaugh takes to his news conference, and I, I hate when people in sports, especially the ones that have all the resources and are in a prime position to be the favorite every week, talk about the odds are against us, and we had to fight through all this adversity. There's adversity, and there's adversity. 
we should know the distinction between the two. Real adversity are things that you can't control that are horrible things that happen to people like illness and so forth. Self-made, self-created adversity. That's not real adversity. Yeah, the guy uh, Valenti from Detroit who's really opinionated. I think that's a Dean's euphemism. party. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> euphemism for way out there in terms of, uh, you know, he's kind of a loose cannon sometimes. He said, I wasn't aware that Jim Harbaugh had passed away from pancreatic cancer, which my wife said, that's not funny, but in a sense, it is funny. So, you know, uh, not to make light of that, but uh, yeah, they acted like it was something much more uh, different when they created all of their own uh, uh, thing. I, I, I had my chat and I kind of turned it into my column on the whole thing. Uh, on on Monday night, and I, I basically said, this judge on Friday, um, to me, you come in, the judge is probably going to ask the questions of the attorneys. You know, one, are you a voluntary member of this organization? Yes. Uh, did you agree to the handbook and the guidelines and the commissioner's purview to this? Yes. Do you not feel that this institution that you're part of has a right to sanction you? Well, I suppose they do. I mean, how can they answer that question? Uh, you know, did you do this? Yes. Then why are we here? You know, do, do you disavow any of the mountains of evidence that the NCAA turned over to the Big Ten and the Big Ten used to make its ruling? And I agree 100 percent with the way it came down. It wasn't that Jim Harbaugh himself did this. But Jim Harbaugh is the standard bearer for the program. The program needs sanctioned. In their mind, the best and most equitable way to solve this in this moment. The rules were broken this year. There needed to be a penalty this year was to take him out of the situation and say, go try and win games without him. And uh, that's your sanction for now. I think the NCAA is going to throw the book at them at a later date. And uh, they're going to have a real problem on their hands, I think, you know, later on. But would I have preferred to see them ruled ineligible? I've said that as much. Can I live with it the way it is? Yes. Does Ohio State need to go up there and win it on their own merits? Yes. So that's kind of my around the bin view of this is that um, they made their bed. They need to lay in it. And. Uh, they are in a complete state of delusion right now. Uh, the Big Ten used words like the NCAA believes and can prove that there was a exhaustive scheme set out, you know, with multiple people to do this. Have they completely connected dots back to the coordinators? This was a question I have. Sharon Moore has been on a college sideline for years. Has he ever been in a situation where someone stood next to him whatever his previous stop was, and yelled, run, pass, left, right, in his ear. And the guy's been right 80% of the time. Has that ever happened? I tend to doubt it. I tend to doubt it. Why, why is this guy so right on everything that he tells me? Never thought to ask that question? Bull crap. So... I'm sitting here with the right and the left in my hands, and I don't know which one to play first. Steve, I'm going to play this one first. Steve, didn't you know that scouting is not illegal? I mean, yeah. haven't, we haven't, 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 haven't we heard? They want to conflate one? the issue every way they can. Yeah. And then the other card is, well, we're just going to take our ball and go to another conference. Uh, good because, because the Big Ten needs Michigan more than Michigan needs the Big Ten. Wrong. Because they sat there and took one game where Michigan played Penn State instead of playing Grand Valley State and looked at the ratings numbers, which were still behind Ohio State, Penn State, and Ohio State, Notre Dame, and extrapolated that through their mouthpiece, Dave Portnoy, that that they are carrying at least 51% of the weight of the Big Ten on, on, their, on their backs. Yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm not impressed. Let's just say that. Uh, and, and, and they can't just pick up and leave. They're under contractual obligations through all these. I mean, there's a TV deal in place that, you know, I presume there's a grant of rights. I don't know what what's tying all these schools to the Big mm -hmm. Ten, but why, 
why would you want to leave? I, I, you know, if you were mad, you're still cashing all these checks. I don't know why. Punishment you without due process breaches the contract, according to message board lawyers. So, yeah, you know, your grant of rights. I mean, I take the scene from Major League and the contract and the unnecessary calisthenics and the bodily fluids. That's what. <laughs> that's what I'm glad. There you go. <laughs> My understanding is Michigan people are mad because of the due process, but basically the the hurried nature of the punishment that is just the first of several punishments to go. That you want to leave the Big Ten because you're getting punished earlier than you an anticipated. But the thing is, this is a punishment of the program, as Steve said, but you're punishing the head of the that program. Would you would Michigan fans, and I'm eventually going to tweet this out and ask, but my mentions have been trashed for three weeks now because of this whole thing. But when Michigan fans, would they rather have the program punished right now, which would be something uh, like a no postseason, or would you rather have your head coach punished, which they're already they were already three and zero without him the first half of the season? This is a, as I've said on other shows, this is a, a punishment without an impact. So it looks like it's big, but they're now four zero without their head coach, and so when they go in front of a judge on Friday, they're not going to be able to argue that this is irreparable harm because so far that irreparable harm has led to a, you're undefeated without your head coach. You're four. No, without your head coach, where is the irreparability? Where is anything being torn asunder? Nothing is being harmed beyond repair. So I, uh, that's why I don't even think that can be an argument in this. They'll have to come up with, they'll do other arguments than that because a judge is going to be like, well, you're four and zero without your head coach. Should you be six and zero in those games, or can you only be four and zero in those games? You know, you can only be four and zero in those games, and you are four and zero in those games. So it doesn't look like your head coach losing him is much of an impact. And honestly, losing the coordinators would be a much larger impact than losing the head coach. Yeah. Losing the guys who call the plays would be much more devastating, much more impactful than losing the head coach, who just looks to side to side and says, "Okay, no, let's punt." Let's punt here. Yeah. And those are the decisions. Franklin, always go to. Oh, no. um, See, losing yeah. George Fra James Franklin, that would have been a benefit <laughs> for Penn State, a the, negative. The line moves Michigan. four points in your favor when he's suspended. Um, you know, uh, shouldn't they just be happy that they're still eligible and just shut yes. the hell up and take their medicine and go on? They are in complete delusion. And I don't know how Manuel and Ono have any kind of integrity and in, in look themselves in the eye and, and, and amidst all this evidence and, and take the positions that they have. But as Kevin said when we were talking at the stadium, it's all to appease their fan base and it's all for show is what it is. When the dust finally settles on this in 12 to 18 months, I wonder if everybody's out of a job because eventually integrity has to prevail and they don't have any right now. Well, I mean, you would expect the AD to go to bat for his guy, but there always were reports that Harbaugh and Ward Manuel had a disconnect. The university president is like, you know, in charge of like everything. And I'm really convinced that he got a taste of cheers and adulations and now is drunk on that and is going to, going to keep swinging on this because, I don't know, he doesn't know any better or something, and he's still better than the guy he replaced, uh, Robert Schlesser or whatever his name was. Uh, I mean, he was a real joy, not wanting to play football and things of that nature, but I think Santa Ono is going to be in the North Pole within two years because uh, it's going to be a cold day in hell before he's going to be able to uh, president a major university again after all of this. It's kind of out of place at this point, but my parting shot on James Franklin uh, and you guys went through all the logistics is obviously no, in addition to all that. Yeah, we, we've combed through. You guys set all that up. I have in the past. I went through all the two point conversions, but the, the, the play calls on the two point conversions. Again, you've got a struggling quarterback and you're going to drop him straight back. You've got no like special play creative play to throw at Michigan, you're going to drop him where he's making on both of those. 
he's making like a 20, 25 yard throw to the back of the end zone by the time it's all said and done. Number one, number two on that fourth <laughs> down play. Well, the third down play told you all you need to know about where Drew Aller's head was at that point. He had a he had a drag route right in front of him. Guys wide open. Caden Saunders right in front of him. He's probably made that throw 200 times since winter workouts, and he missed it by that much behind him. He was just not there, not handling the situation. So you don't read your quarterback that he can't handle this fourth and six, but you've got arguably the best defense in the country, and they're pretty much giving up running the ball on third and seven, third and eight, punt the ball. The analytics probably said otherwise because you get two chances to score if you convert rather than you're limiting yourself to one possible drive if your defense stops. Well, the analytics, the analytics. were 0 for 2 right. on the uh, yeah. 0 for 1 the first time on the going for 2. So I guess you do at that point. Well, <laughs> analytics, you, 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 you want to bat like 53% on that. And so, hey, we're due. But the analytics, throw out the analytics. I don't want to hear about the analytics. You have to know who you're playing, who you are. The analytics takes into account games against Rice, Eastern Michigan, Loyola Marymount. It doesn't take into account you are playing Michigan right now and you need to face that fact. And that that fourth and sixth pass to nobody, there was nobody there. I don't know where he was throwing it. I just I didn't want to get sacked, so I'm going to throw it away. Like Bad. Well, and the thing is, analytics don't account for Jimmy's and Joe's, and uh, Jimmy Allar was not playing his best football at that point. And um, you had you probably had a better shot of putting in the hands of Chop Robinson and and uh, and Abdul Carter and guys like that. And you know, yeah, Blake Corum is not probably going to get the ball stripped from him, but you know, crazy things can happen in those instances. You had some timeouts, try and get the ball back. See if you can take one more running start at it, but putting all your putting all your eggs in that one basket at that point is a fireable offense. And um, you know, I, I I'm I'm still at a loss for words. It's 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 Wednesday, almost noon, and I'm still at a loss for words for that. That was yeah. that was some bad coaching. Uh, I'm right. They there had a chance to. 40. They had a chance to be right there at the end, no doubt. And uh, it was just a, a game long malaise that Penn State was stuck in. Um, a lot of sentiment, Ohio State dodged a bullet and didn't take Drew Aller because even the passes he completed, like the tight end had to jump, jump two feet up in the air to catch the ball. I mean, nothing was hitting it. He was throwing it everywhere, but where his receiver's hands were. I mean, they're here, they're here. You know, it's they had no chance. He, he didn't give his guys a chance to make any plays. And you know, all that promise that Penn State had was that this was this was their year. They just didn't have it. They got a great defense, but nothing on offense, and they're back to square one next year. I mean, it's it's going to be ugly. That Penn State version of Drew Allar is probably not the version of Drew Allar that exists in a world of where he goes to Ohio State. In my yeah, opinion. That could be too, because uh, he'd have better people around him, no doubt. And, and potentially better coaching at, at, at at, at quarterback and you know we're getting into a very hypothetical situation there but i don't think that i don't think you can take a piece off of one chessboard and put it on another <laughs> chessboard in a, a, a parallel universe and say that it's apples for apples i think everything has a bit of a butterfly effect and everything else so you know i i try to i try to caution people when they say it on our message board or on twitter or whatever about a kid sucking at one school or whatever, and that that would have been that would have been absolute in every other in every other Rick and Morty universe. And I'm like, that's not necessarily true. Every you know, there are a lot of variables that that differ on each on each playing board. Just ask Tim Tim Couch. Yeah, the term uh, uh, trash is way overused in sports. There's no question about that by these fan bases. Uh, I, I let them know all the time. I would love to see somebody follow you at your job and evaluate <laughs> you. Are, are you really better than the people we're talking about at your job? I I tend to doubt it. Before we get Excel to... Excel uh, faster. Excel faster. <laughs> I, I've seen better spreadsheets out of a four-year-old. Stupid. Trash. Trash. Rico. Cry harder. Copium. 
Before we get to Rose, we got David Greenshield putting a cap on the Michigan conversation. Should the Cowboys sue over the America's team? Kevin is the <laughs> resident. Between A&M and the Seattle Seahawks over who who really owned the 12th man. I mean, I mean, we could have lots of lawsuits. I mean, go for it. I mean, Jer- Jerry's got nothing better to do. Not going to make the playoffs, I'm sure. And I say that as a Cowboys fan. Is, is is Dallas still America's team? I don't. I think people are tired of Dallas. That's just my opinion. We don't I need. To- yeah, my Twitter went all the way back to Tom Landry to post a uh, uh, a retort to to Jimmy to Jimmy. All right, we've got uh, Rose here. Thank you, Rose, for the contribution. David, you as well. Thank you for the contribution. All right, size up uh, all these possible playoff opponents. Guess we can start with you, Tony. Ohio State against Washington, Georgia, Bama, Florida State. You know, who are the favorable matchups, more interesting matchups, tougher matchups? Yeah, I, I would love to see Ohio State's secondary against Washington's passing game. I think they'd give up some yards, but I think the the winner there is Ohio State's offense versus Washington's defense, which has been pretty pretty bad lately. And Ohio State's offense is kicking kicking it into gear. So I think Ohio State would win. A shootout there. I think they could. I think they'd beat Florida State, um, Georgia, ba- Bama. Bama's also kicking it up a notch right now. They're they've learned how to use Jalen Milrow, and he's learned how to not do what he doesn't do. And, and they're accent, accent, accentuating everything he does. And defense is getting better. So I, I don't want to lean into the SEC bias, but I would say OSU. Uh, I take OSU against Washington, Florida State, and feel pretty good about it. I wouldn't feel good about taking Ohio State against Georgia and Alabama at this point. Um, I agree on Florida State and Washington. During our CFP show, we talked about what happens if Oregon comes out of there. Oregon could be kind of a bad matchup because you truly have to outscore Oregon, and I don't know how that one fits. Georgia, you know, you give Ryan Day 30 days to prepare and you give him a functioning running back room and some things. And, you know, maybe maybe they don't target Marvin Harrison Jr. I'm sure that's going to end up in a clip somewhere. You, if they don't target him and you see what happens there. Alabama, you know, uh, Jalen Milrow has two things. He's got his legs mm-hmm. and he's got the deep ball. And that's really kind of it. So if you can remind your safeties, don't let the guy get past you. I kind of like their chances with that. You know, I think we're going to see what the mobile quarterback looks like truly next week with J.J. McCarthy's escapability and his ability to extend plays and things of that nature. A lot can happen between now and then. We're still looking at potentially three more games of football with with uh, Minnesota, Michigan, a Big Ten championship game, and then even four if they get all the way to a championship game. So, you know, what your rosters look like and what their rosters look like could be very different at that point. Um, the one thing I'm going to take pause is, is that we we know that you have to score a lot of points in a, in a college football playoff championship game. That has just been the norm. And that would be the one thing for sure that would concern me as an Ohio State person is will Ohio State be able to get up there? It's great that you're holding teams to 10.7 points per game right now, but I can't sit there and in the first 10 minutes of the show talk about what trash Big Ten offenses are uh, and then sit there and, and not say that on the on the back end you're going to be playing, you would be playing real legitimate offenses in a lot of these teams. I think they're down to 9.9 after last week. That's what they're giving up. Yeah. Only scoring, only scoring thirty three point three. That's very un Ryan Day like. But yeah, if I had to pick them, uh, I'd like them against Washington. Uh, I mean, God, Penix, he could. He's already proven he could throw for four hundred yards against Ohio State, though. Uh, Georgia, man, Georgia a month ago, two months ago, uh, without Bowers. Yes, I like that. Uh, Georgia now with Bowers, uh, maybe not quite as much. Bama, two months ago, Milro didn't know which way was up. Yes. Bama today, Milro knows exactly which way is up. <laughs> he knows exactly which way the end zone is. 
and he's playing super football right now. Uh, tough one. FSU, uh, you know, I honestly haven't followed anything that they've done, to be honest. I mean, I really – they got the quarterback, Jordan Travis, and that's about – I mean, they're playing in a really awful conference. Uh, I don't know. I I mean, can they beat Louisville? That's I think that's their first order of business. So, I don't know. Uh, I would think OSU would be favored there. Um, yeah. So, I don't know. They got to beat Michigan. That's that's all that matters. Beat Michigan. If they beat Michigan and lose the next game by 38 points, I don't think anybody will give a crap, to be honest with you. I think Michigan is the uh, is the uh, mission this year, and uh, I don't think it's a national championship team. I think it's a national championship defense. It can be a national championship offense if they put it all together, which, you know, we really haven't seen them do that against a great defense yet. So maybe next week will be that week, but uh, yeah, we'll see. And the special teams, they're not even MAC championship level. So I don't know what to say about that. Just stop making mistakes. You don't need to return kicks. You don't need to return punts. Do you know just just go to the go to the white hat before the game and say we are fair catching everything that we are eligible to fair catch. Yeah. And then, know- and then and then anybody who thinks they're going to run a fake if you run a fake and it's not called we're going to lock you in the injury tent. The- <laughs> with a snake. <laughs> Do you know they won the game by 35 points and they had so many positive things happen. I got on our post game call with Dave Biddle, you know, with a podcast thing live. And the first thing I see pop up in the scroll at the bottom is, did anybody ask Ryan Day about the special teams? <laughs> no, it never came up because they won the game by 35 points and were glorious in doing it. So it was all happy talk after a game like that. Let's squeeze this one in because Mika has asked a number of times. So... Do you guys I had, he has on our call call today too. Jack Sawyer stay another year? No and no. Okay. Well, I don't think either of them are first round pick. Uh, I mean, Jack Sawyer would have to go to the combine and just knock everybody's socks off. Um, I think both of them would benefit by coming back and working up toward being first round picks. Kevin, you know, I I can understand why they would leave. I mean, it you know, go get paid, but the same time, I mean, you know, they've left a lot of meat on the bone here at Ohio State. There's a lot they could still accomplish and show. I'll tell you, it would mean the world because I think there's only going to be about eight returning starters out of 22 coming back on this team, and uh, that may be charitable. So I think anybody who has – It's going to be mass exodus, period. Yeah. yeah. My call has not been able to stay healthy. I think that he just needs to start the clock on his NFL career, and I don't – I think Jack Sawyer is what he is. I think, yeah. I mean, if, if, if you're going to sit there and say, what is he at late three, early four? I mean, I don't know. I mean, is he going, is he going to come back and suddenly like change everything? I mean, I, I don't think we're going to necessarily see a change in how Ohio state schemes its defense to put him potentially in some better positions. I mean, Ohio state certainly can make its pitch, but I think really the answer is on almost anybody not named Kyle McCord who has an NFL decision, are they going or are they leaving? The answer is they're leaving. And I mean, I'm just not trying to be curt or short or cute with the answer. No, I think you're, you're grounded in reality. It's my belief. It's it's my belief. I think you're grounded in complete reality. I think there's a lot of people that see themselves in the NFL next year. And I think they're going to have a, uh, a harsh reality that they're not going to go in the first three rounds. I mean, it's just, you know, they're good players, but they're not, you know, a lot, you know, half these guys are, are going to be late round picks or even undrafted free agents, perhaps. I mean, if they go, so I guess we'll see. Mike call has 17 tackles, two tackles for loss and one and a half sacks this season. He needs to come back. I understand what Kevin is saying and everybody was expecting this to be his last year based on some flashes last year, but he hasn't been healthy for his entire career, and if if he goes without doing, without showing his showing the ability to stay healthy for a season, he's going to harm his draft stock. But we've also seen other Ohio State defensive linemen that really care about the draft stock and leave anyway. Like Zach Harrison 
could have done more to help his draft stock even after he chose to leave Ohio State, and he didn't. So uh, the the end goal for just about everybody is the NFL, and when you have an opportunity to go do that, it's hard to talk yourself out of it, especially if, if you do have trouble staying healthy. Like, what's what are the what are the chances you stay healthy as a senior when you haven't been able to stay healthy for your first three years? Yeah. Well, it is good for all of us to be founded in reality. So let's follow Kevin. Kevin, what do you have uh, available for the fine folks this week? Uh, Tale of the Tape coming out tomorrow. It's a movie theme. We're going to the movies with Tale of the Tape. I have to do that to keep myself entertained because I do not give a flying toot about this Minnesota game. But we got that coming up. And, you know, as for this week, I'm, I'm just having a real hard time finding motivation, as, as you've noticed, to get excited about Minnesota. So I'm already starting to get things ready for Michigan week and everything that happens there. So just keep an eye out for that. And we're also going to be announcing a really cool contest with one of our sponsors that will be coming out this week. So keep an eye on my social media and Buckeye Huddle for details on that for a chance to win a nice prize. Tony? Uh, yeah, uh, I'll be writing a story today about Ohio State playing its best offensive de and defense in November. I asked both uh, Ryan Day and Jim Knowles about that, and they both said that, yep, they are. So I'll, I'll write about that, and I'll get that posted at some point today. And then we dropped our live reaction to the college football playoff show on Buckeye Weekly. That's on all of the – that's the latest episode on all of your podcast platforms. And as Kevin said – starting to gear up for Michigan week because there are not enough hours in the day to prepare for it and to produce for it, especially when two of those days are, you know, holiday and one of those days is travel and it's, it's, it's a fun time, but it is a crammed time. Why don't we take this one next week? Rose, you come on back next week and we will size up JJ McCarthy and Kyle McCord and give you exact statistical predictions thanks rose appreciate it steve what you doing this week well i got radio shots in dayton and canton today tape in a segment with spectrum that i do every week spectrum sports or spectrum news ohio and um we also do a show uh, the big Ohio football show. It's on channel four WCMH here in Columbus uh, every Friday night, seven 30. And then it's also shown, I think in Youngstown, Dayton, Cleveland, three other markets. So that's kind of cool as well on, uh, on their affiliates, but uh, got all that going on. Agree with what these guys are saying. Uh, just kind of building up toward Minnesota right now. Again, look for a carbon copy of last week. If they can, win the game handily and get everybody out of there. That'd be great. And then it's on to Michigan and the coverage of that will start at about 4 p.m. on uh, or well, 7.30 p.m. on Saturday. That the questions will start flowing to the players and the coaches of, uh, you know, how do you get ready to go up to Michigan and, and pull off uh, the unthinkable, which is to beat the, the two-time, two-time defending Big Ten champion Michigan Wolverines, the, the biggest – game in the history of the game so coming up next week in ann arbor so looking forward to it folks do one thing for me hit the like button on your way out and uh, we've got an oklahoma show that's our next show coming up at four eastern time over on that channel and we got a big 12 channel that we launched at the beginning of the season so please watch it there as well tony thank you for being here steve you as well of course kevin thanks for being here making this happen 241 times you guys have a great week and despite kevin's angst please try to enjoy the minnesota game in some shape or form 